Light From the earliest grease lamps in stone bowls to the vast electric lamps that shine on football stadiums to the lasers that cut through space, light has been a defining characteristic of our striving towards civilization. But it is a thing often taken for granted in this day and age of electricity and house lamps and street lights. Would that be the case in your fantasy world? What if light is not commonly available? What if you have to struggle for your light? What if your light comes from your gods? What if your light comes from your magic? Today, let's explore those questions together. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. In this episode, I want to talk to you about what light is and what its generation means for your world, how you can use it, and how it helps you build engaging cultures and great magic systems. I use light in my worlds as well, and you can read all about it in my epic fantasy series, Sangwheel Chronicles, which deals with the thematic elements of how the past affects the future. Light is a very central part of one character's magical journey, and you can pick those books up at any retailer, and currently the ebooks are $1 each on Amazon.com for the 2023 December sale. So rush over there and pick yourself up a copy of Sangwheel Chronicles. Okay, enough of that. Let's get going with light in fantasy worlds. As we normally do on this channel, I would like to start with the actual history of light in our world. So, let's talk history of illumination. I've talked before about fire being a pivotal technology, a real game changer for our species. Books that deal with this theme include Jane M. All's Earth Children and The Quest for Fire, which was also turned into a movie. So fire is where it all began, but today we're going beyond the flames to the very first lamps. In the year 70,000 BCE, our ancestors were carving out hollow rocks, filling them with moss soaked in animal fat and setting them ablaze. Simple? Absolutely. Effective? You bet. This was our first step into the world of crafted light sources. We've had those stone lamps since basically forever. So if all else fails in your world, hollow out some rocks, damp, dump some moss into it, dribble animal fat over it, and you've got yourself a lamp. But lamps didn't stay that simple. During the New Stone Age and the Bronze Age, we developed the oil lamp initially. Now, these were just seashells with a bit of oil and a plant fiber wick. But as time went on, we started crafting them from pottery, alabaster, and metal. In archaeological finds, these are often intricately decorated. They weren't just for light, they were art, they were reverence, they were statements. And that's why I always say, don't forget about pottery and ceramics in your world and in your cultures. And if you haven't checked out my video on that topic yet, hit the info card right over there. But let's keep moving. When Rome fell, Europe kind of lost track of lamps. Don't worry, the Middle East kept lamps lit, and we get the legends of genies or jinn from around that time, a topic we will talk more about shortly. But first, let's check out what Europe did during the Middle Ages when they had lost track of Roman la lamps. Mostly, they used candles. Candles are pretty simple. They were invented in Egypt around 3000 BCE. They're made from wax, tallow, and a fibrous wick. Simple, yet a beacon of medieval life. Did you know that in Paris, a tax list from 1292 lists 71 candle makers? That's right, taxes, the eternal constant, giving us a peek into the past. But candles can be more than light. Because they burn at a steady rate, they can be a clock as well. And indeed, that's exactly how I use them in Sangwheel Chronicles. And using this kind of timekeeping mechanism gave me some awesome world-building elements because I have expressions unique to my world like 
time burns away for time passing or stretch the wick for making time for something. Like some of my characters will say, I'll stretch the wick to talk to you, meaning I'll make time to talk to you. And these phrases are born from my timekeeping system and they allow me to show my world organically to my readers rather than telling my world to my readers. And if you want to develop a timekeeping system like that for your world, check out my video on timekeeping devices in fantasy worlds. Okay, so we have lamps in the east and we have candles in the west and, well, everywhere really, but candles in the west. And that's more or less where things stood until the 18th century, candles and lamps all over the place. Now, the 18th century rolled in with a bang. During this century, we had the invention of the central burner and the glass chimney. Both made light much brighter. And then came gas. Streets bathed in light, homes glowing, a whole new world literally lighting up our lives. This era, my friends, is what gas lamp fantasy feeds on. Gas started with the flame directly serving as the light. So if you're in the early gas lamp era, you've got flames burning straight inside the lamps. But in the later era, they actually used the fire to heat a refractive, non-combustible material. Do you know what material they used for that? Lime. They used lime. You know where the expression of in the limelight comes from? Yep, you got it in one. It's not just fantasy where light influences language. So, in your slightly later gas lamp fantasy, instead of direct flame light, use limelight, where the fire heats lime and the lime produces a steady white light that is far brighter than straight flame. Now, of course, the 19th century wasn't just about gas. It was also about electricity making its grand debut. The first attempt at light was the arc lamps. This is an electric arc struck between electrodes of carbon. It worked pretty well for street lamps, but it's a little cumbersome. In 1876, Pavel Yablochokov, a Russian electrical engineer, invented the Yablochokov candle. This is an arc lamp that has two carbon rods separated by porcelain clay. I told you ceramics is important. Um, this vaporized during the burning of the arc, and the Yablochokov candle was widely used as street lighting for quite a long time. But then there's the two big names, Swan and Edison. Swan was the first to devise carbon filaments of cotton threads treated with sulfuric acid and mounted in glass vacuum bulbs. These vacuum bulbs were only made possible because of the invention of the vacuum pump by Hermann Sprengel and Sir William Crookes. Edison started his work in 1877 and conducted over a thousand experiments in two years. Finally, in 1879, he got a bulb to burn for 13.5 hours, which was a pretty solid record for the time, and he patented the incandescent light bulb. I just want to make a note here on world-building technology. I recently made a video about world-building technology for science fantasy where I speak about the importance of technology building on each layer and expanding technology rather than building completely new technologies that have got nothing to do with each other. And you can absolutely see in the development of illumination in our history how that works in our world. So if you're building tech in your world, remember, one thing builds on another. No invention leaps fully formed from someone's mind. As I always say, ideas need ideas in order to breed innovation. They don't do well in a vacuum, unlike light. Anyway, we've come a long way since the incandescent light bulb. We're in a world of LEDs and lasers and underwater diving torches. But looking back, it all started out with hollowed out rocks and moss. And if you loved this journey through the history of lamps, fire and all things bright, smash that thumbs up button and let's switch gears to the world of light religion, both real and fantastical. 
From ancient lamps to the flicker of the candle, light has always been more than just a way to banish the darkness. It's been a symbol, a guide in our spiritual journey. We use lamps even today in almost all of our religions. In Hinduism, lamps are lit during prayers, embodying the triumph of light over darkness, good over evil, knowledge over ignorance. The lamp is not just a source of light. It represents the human soul, a fragment of the divine light itself. Buddhism sees lamps as a metaphor for the teachings of Buddha, shining a path towards enlightenment. They stand for the wisdom that scatters the shadows of ignorance. In Christianity, lighting a lamp or a candle symbolizes the presence of Christ, often referred to as the light of the world. It's a representation of the Holy Spirit guiding believers on their spiritual path. Judaism celebrates Hanukkah by lighting lamps or candles commemorating the miraculous oil that burned for eight days in the temple. This light is also a symbol of God's enduring presence. And even in Feng Shui, lamps and candles create a harmonious environment. The right placement and type of lamp can influence the flow of energy, affecting mind and body alike. So, when you're designing rituals in your world, think about the role of light. Do people light special lamps or candles? Is there a scent or color associated with these? Take, for instance, Finland's Independence Day, where half-white, half-blue candles are burnt, echoing the national flag. It is a cultural embodiment of the light of our independence. But there's no reason just to stop using light in rituals. Let's talk about gods of light. History is rich with deities like the Zapotec's Kokihan and the Sumerian's Aya, Mother of the Dawn, or the Norse Balder, personifying light and dawn. And these deities are all associated with light. But the real goat of light religions in our world has to be Ahura Mazda from Zoroastrianism. This was possibly the world's first monotheistic religion, although you could argue that it is a dualistic religion. And it was born in ancient Persia. Ahura Mazda, the god of light and goodness, stands in eternal opposition to angry Manyu, the embodiment of darkness and evil. This dualism probably inspired George R. R. Martin in A Song of Ice and Fire, where R'hllor, the lord of light, and the white walkers, or the others, mirror this ancient conflict. You can see that in how the priests of R'hllor are taught magic and the priests of Ahura Mazda are called Magai. You can see that in how the White Walkers, or the others as they're called in the books, bring winter and a thousand years of darkness in opposition to the light. Our religious history is always a rich source of inspiration to draw on for fantasy worlds, and this is especially true in the case of light with which we have such an intense relationship over the years of our civilizations. So don't just restrict yourself to creating a god of light. Think about what opposes such a deity. Think about the thematic elements of good versus evil, the light of civilization versus the terror of the night. The the night is dark and full of terrors, after all. Consider how light shapes civilizations and hence religion. Could there be temples with eternal flames, ceremonies centered around lighting sacred fires, or divine magic drawn from the light itself? And don't forget about art. You could use shadow plays in religious storytelling, or have priests adorned with reflective vestments, creating dazzling light shows during ritual. Remember, light isn't just about warding off physical darkness. It's about shaping belief, culture, and the very essence of civilization. It's a constant across all of our many cultures, and its use holds great potential for a fantasy world builder in terms of the thematic depths that it offers.
And if this journey through the realms of light and faith sparked your imagination, consider giving this video a super thanks. And let's keep the conversation glowing as we dive into light and magic next. I am so sorry about that pun. I'm hoping they kind of work, but I am so sorry. Okay, moving on. So in magic and light, let's get the obvious one out of the way. Light is perfect for creating illusions, and this is a topic I have delved, delved into in another video. Check it out in this information card. It's a good watch. I promise you'll enjoy it. But let's not stop with illusions. Light has so much more to offer. Imagine using light for transportation. Light moves at, well, the speed of light. So transforming into light could mean near instantaneous travel within a world. Think of the storytelling potential if a mage could become light, journeying through space while conscious. That would make for some amazing storytelling. Light also naturally lends itself to spells of creation and control. You could have street lamps that are magic, or mages can just create light as they need. So you never have a need for street lamps at all, and you never develop that technology. All of those are viable options. But I don't just want to talk about light in this situation. After all, Creating light and light spells and so on are something that I think anybody can think of. So I want to talk about the accoutrements of light in this topic of magic. And that means it's finally time to talk about jinn. Originally, jinn were believed to be supernatural beings in the Arabian Peninsula. With the advent of Islam, they transformed into lesser spirits serving Allah, as mentioned in the Quran. But they also entered folklore and fairy tales, notably in Arabian Nights, which was translated into French. And this brings us to the story of Aladdin and his genie, first in a ring, then in a lamp, of course, brought famously to life by Robin Williams in the fantastic 90s movie Aladdin. But why would I focus on genies in this video about light? Well, because genies embody contract magic. And this type of magic, as I've discussed before, is, for me, intrinsically linked to civilization. Contracts, after all, are a social construct. This connection makes it logical that such a magic be associated with lamps, which are symbols of civilized light. So imagine a magic system where lamps play a key role in contract magic. Perhaps a contract only becomes binding when a specific lamp burns, releasing fragrances symbolic of civilization's light. Or maybe the ink for the contract is prepared in a particular lamp, or the sealing wax is melted from a special candle. These details add layers to your magic, weaving the themes like the nature of contracts and civilization's influence on magic. This kind of thematic exploration makes your world so much richer because of these subtle elements playing out in the background that, sure, many of your readers won't pick up on, but for those who do, it will make your world such a rich thematic experience. So when crafting your magic, think about how it interacts with civilization. Is it enhanced by civilization, or does it stand in opposition? How does light play into this dynamic? Maybe there are dual aspects of magic, one strengthened by light and another by darkness. Such nuances create a rich, cohesive world where magic, civilization, and even religion intertwine, offering your readers a deeper experience full of wonder and mystery. So when you're creating a source of illumination in your world, don't just plonk down a candle. Think about that candle's history, its impact on religion, and its effect on magic. Consider how it's used in art and what it symbolizes to the cultures of your world. 
And those are my thoughts on illumination in fantasy world. If you've enjoyed this episode, do check out my video on contract magic in fantasy worlds. Clicking on these end screens really does help the channel grow since it encourages YouTube to show other people my videos as well. So if you could, please do clicky on these end screens. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.